Just uh, to talk about the future plans, the, the, the things that we want to work on uh, coming next down the pipe so people have more context. The work to do in 2017, the, the, it's really a list of about five things, probably two of them we'll, we'll get to or three of them we'll get to. Uh, the, the top, the number one thing I think that we need to do is work on productizing our test suite. So right now we have this really great um, test suite in RxJS that looks like this. this is actually a screenshot of one of the tests in our library. So we run 2,400 tests or something like that in a matter of a, a second, second and a half. It's pretty quick, depending on your machine, uh, with these sort of tests where you're able to kind of represent uh, what's happening in an observable as like this ASCII art, where you can kind of line up these marble diagrams and be like, OK, so every dash right now represents like 10 virtual milliseconds. And every little non-dash, and they're like in this case it's numbers or, or letters, uh, represents where a value will be emitted from that observable. And it works really well for testing RxJS, the library. However, when you get into real-world scenarios, this, is, this isn't great, because we've got a few things in here. We've got some magic globals um, with these, the cold and hot functions you see in here. And down below, there's uh, expect observable and expect subscriptions and these other things that we're using to assert. Uh, and you know, if a dash is, represents 10 virtual milliseconds, you know, what do you do if you have two milliseconds you want to represent? Or, you know, what if it's three hours or some longer number? You don't want to type that many dashes. That's, that's pretty brutal. Uh, and also, there's, it's, it's kind of not really apparent, like, what you're doing to flush um, some of these tests. Or, you know, what if you want to test things incrementally, like, go this far and then go this far and so on. Like, see what's happening uh, with whatever you're trying to compose with RxJS. So we want to have more of a, a test suite that any, anyone can use with anybody's, um, you know, whether they're using Mocha or Jasmine or uh, Jest or whatever. Uh, and this is this is kind of a, a straw man proposal uh, that Jay Phelps was working on, uh, where we have a static method on our test scheduler uh, that al that gives you some of these magic globals, and inside of that that function, that function will run. It'll it'll set up the test scheduler, and at the end of running that function, it will flush the test scheduler. Now, what the test scheduler is, for those of you who aren't familiar, is um, within RxJS, we have the concept of scheduling. And uh, we do scheduling with schedulers. And with the scheduler, you kind of pass it some work that you wanted to do, and you give it a time at which you, wanted to, you want to do it. And there's different types of schedulers. So there's uh, the default scheduler, which is no scheduling at all. You just call the function immediately if, if, the, if the scheduling is, is nothing, if there's nothing to be scheduled if it's zero. Uh, there is uh, the ASAP scheduler, which is just like a promise. So that's going to happen on the next micro task or the next, the next job. Um, there's the timeout scheduler, I believe it's called, or the async scheduler. It's the async scheduler, uh, which just runs like a set timeout. So that would happen after your micro task. Uh, there's animation frame schedulers and so on. What the test scheduler is, is it is uh, virtual scheduler. So what happens when you schedule something in the test scheduler is it puts it into this big queue. And then when you flush the test scheduler, it goes through the queue uh, uh, in a FIFO way, and it, it runs those tasks. And what we can do with that is then we can synchronously run things that would normally run asynchronously, and we can, we can test them in a deterministic way. So that's what this, exactly what this is doing. And the, the, the problems are, as I've stated, it works really, really well for testing RxJS, the library, but maybe not so great in the real world. So the, the first challenge is uh, we have APIs that have default scheduling, like delay or something like that. So if somebody has this, this uh, function here, call, we'll just call it get source, and they have this observable, and they're just using delay in the default manner, which uses the async scheduler, I think, by default for a three-second delay. Currently, to test this, they'd have to rewrite their get source function to you know, allow themselves to inject a scheduler in there so they could pass in the test scheduler. Um, that's, not, that's not ideal. I, I, ideally, we would be able to say, OK, well, while we know you're testing this within that test scheduler run block, we can go in and we can patch all of our, all of our existing schedulers to automatically put things in the test scheduler for you so they run in a deterministic way. 
The second challenge for this is uh, one of the things I already stated, really long running observables. And we, we haven't really decided a great way to, to solve this problem. This is something that you know, I, I'd be looking to people in this room for, for solutions for, or anyone that, that watches this later, if they have a great idea, I'd love to hear it. Uh, and this is, you know, here I've got a, a situation where I've got a timer that's set for four days. I've got some node service that like, is using an observable to say, hey, four days, four days from now, let's run this thing. Um, yeah, you're going to type 35 megabytes of, of dashes to do that with the marble diagram. It's not going to be cool. Um, obviously, you could code your way around that, right? You would just generate the string. I wouldn't expect people to really do that. That would be nuts. But uh, still, it's, it's not ideal for our fancy marble uh, tests. And so we need to have a nice, easily readable, ergonomic way to have that, like those longer numbers work into that. So it, it, your tests are still easy to read. Um, but you can accommodate these, these longer uh, times. And then, of course, the, this is a related challenge. It's basically the same challenge, the fine-tune tests. You know, you know, what, what do you do now? If, if you've got five milliseconds and, and all those dashes are representative of, of 10 milliseconds, like how do you fine-tune that? Ideally, we could still fit it into something easy to read, like the marble diagram. But again, we haven't come up with a great solution for this yet, because it also has to work with our, you know, our, our challenge two here. So I'm looking to, for, to the community for any great ideas around that. We've, we've kicked around a few ideas that we can discuss later, but um, nothing really jumped out at us. Why don't you just have, this is a naive question, but why don't you just have an argument that allows you to specify the um, interval of the dashes? Because it varies. Yeah, because that's the, the argument. So the, the question is, why not just specify the, the length? Like sometimes it's 10, sometimes it's whatever because it could vary. Like what, what, then you're in a situation where maybe you have a test that worries about two milliseconds from now, do this thing, and three days from now, do this thing. And so you could end up varying these things. Yeah. So is the challenge just how to syntactically express this, or is it also how yeah. to actually do the scheduling under the hood so that we don't have to wait four days for the test? I think the, the no, the, schedu the scheduling part isn't the challenge. That's, that's the challenge is how do we do this in such a way that people's tests are readable? Um, which is hard. If you go and you look at the older versions of RxJS, you look at the, the tests there, what you'll see is you know, these really, really long tests where they're calling on next do this, on next do this, on next do this. Um, it's, oh, it's worth mentioning too that this marble diagram idea that we, that we have came from Andre Stoltz who is listening in. I don't wanna, don't wanna skip that, it was a brilliant idea. Um, I had the pleasure of implementing it, but yeah. So the, the, the problem is how do we get the same sort of ergonomics the marble diagrams give us but still accommodate these, you know, these, these one-off scenarios. Or not, they're not even really one-off, you know, maybe in a real-world app, so. Andre has a comment. He said, an idea is to introduce a new syntax that represents a special dash with semantics. Wait this much time. Yeah, that's, that is, that's, a, that's, a, solid, that's a solid idea. So the, the, just to reiterate, Andre had an idea to which is to introduce some additional, like, presumably some ASCII or Unicode character that you could use to, to represent like a, a different time interval. Christmas tree. Tomorrow. Christmas tree. Emojis. I like the, the Christmas tree emoji. Or, or like, could you just have a dictionary where you pass your own uh, keys? Of yeah, that's, that's, that's what the marble that. diagrams actually create. So yeah, but that's, that's, I mean, that's, again, this why we're presenting this stuff is so we can, we can bounce these ideas off you brilliant folks and, and get some stuff. It's yeah. funny how you thought you were going to be able to present the idea and then not have a whole bunch of people at oh, yeah. college. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to name it? <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, we, I mean, if, if, if we're going to, if we have ideas for this, we can save it for after so I could talk about some of the other, uh, did, did you? I was just going to say you could uh, make the parser like you can customize it per test, right? Like at the beginning, you're like register star means these are these are days. awesome ideas. We'll we'll talk we'll talk about it after I present the other stuff that we have to the other goals that we have for RxJS. Those are great ideas, though. All right, so moving on, there is and this is a, this is actually a much bigger chunk of work is the scheduler and error error handling overhaul. So this the the idea for this is actually modeled after uh, MostJS. So I I. I worked with Brian Cavalier and looked at what MostJS was doing. MostJS, if you look at all of the um, observable type libraries and you kind of run them uh, against each other in the same sort of scenarios, only MostJS is faster than RxJS 5 right, right now. And it's, it's because it's, it's a lot leaner, but it's also because it's doing one interesting thing, which is it centralizes all of its error handling uh, in, in one location. 
So right now, error handling lives throughout Rx. So everywhere you provide, like say you provide a, a projection function to a map operator, or you provide a function to flat map or whatever, anywhere you provide a function, we're wrapping that in a try catch in some way, usually the most performant way we can. Uh, and if there's an error that comes out of that function, we send it down the error path in the observable. Uh, so the, the problem with that is, is try catch causes deoptimizations. So like if there's a try catch in your function, uh, it can't be inlined by V8, uh, at least currently. Um, and I don't know if it ever will be able to. So what happens is you'll have this call stack where multiple functions in the call stack uh, deopt and you can't, you can't inline the, the entire thing or as much of the, the thing as, you, as uh, the, the engine will allow. Um, so the, the solution to this that most JS took is to actually move all the try catching to as far down to the bottom of the call stack as you can. And in our case, that could be the scheduler. So if we scheduled everything that was going to be dispatched through your observable from the source, then that means if the try catching is in the scheduler and there's any error downstream, it's going to unwind the stack back to that try catch and we can, we can send, it on, send it on the way. So that way we only have one function that's been de-optimized and everything above it, the, the uh, JavaScript engines are free to try to optimize as best they can, you know, provided that the user function passed in doesn't have a try catch in it or something. So the, the catch to this problem is catch, actually. The catch operator, uh, which you, I don't believe, will find in, in most JS, at least the last time I looked, um, makes this difficult. So here I've got a scenario where I've got a source observable uh, with finished notation for Andre. And right after that, I've got a catch operator, then a map, then a filter, then another catch operator, then a subscribe. And so the, the problem comes in that, well, well we can have our, we can have our, uh, our source is going to schedule. We'll say our try catching is all down there in this, in this new architecture. If right here we've got our catches, then if something happens in that middle, that map or filter operation, those, those two rectangles in the middle there, those in one of those observers, we want, the, we want the proper catch observer to be notified of that. And if, but if our try catch is all the way down in that yellow square there, down at the source, then what's going to happen is whenever our filter function throws, uh, it unwinds the stack back to the schedule where the try catch is. And then if it uses its own observer to send that, that error message back up, it's going to hit the wrong catch. So even though the error was thrown in the filter, and you would expect that, that error to be caught by the catch after the filter, it's going to unwind the stack back to the try catch. The try catch says, oh, I've got an error path, and sends it up from there, and you hit the wrong catch. So that's, that's not what we want. What we really want is we really want to jump back up to the observer we were on when we had the problem and send it up that guy's error path. So what we, what we do is we actually, it, every single next or error method, we just keep a thread local variable um, of what is the current observer. And that way, when an error does get hit in that try catch, we say, what's the, what's the uh, current observer thread local? Send it to that. So it's, it's, a, it's a little ugly, but it does perform pretty well. In the prototyping work I did around this, it, it looked to be about uh, t twice as fast uh, for, for most, mo the most common operations uh, that we were doing as, as opposed to RxJS 5. Now this is a really rough number um, because the prototype is pretty rough. Uh, but it's the, lar the longer the, the observer chain, the, the better this, this number seems to be. So it also has an added benefit for Node.js, and this is something that Netflix is keenly interested in. A lot of Node uh, developers and, and uh, a lot of Node application concerns are that uh, you don't want to try catch in a Node process, or at least this is a, a philosophical thing with a lot of Node developers. You don't want to try catch in a Node process. You just want to panic and, and die. And that reason is so you get the core dump, so you can analyze that and you can see exactly what was in memory when there was an error. You can see exactly the line of code you're on and so on. As soon as you try catch, you lose that, that visibility. So for greater visibility, Node.js doesn't want to have the try catching. And guess what? If all our try catching is centralized in the scheduler, that means I can give you a scheduler that has no try catching in it and you get that panic and die behavior. So, but the, the problem, the, the thing about this is, is it's lots of work because you have to refactor the schedulers, uh, which 
anyone that's looked at the scheduler code will tell you is no simple task. Um, it also means that uh, observable itself needs to be refactored to make sure that uh, it's using the, the proper um, observer type basically to ensure that there's scheduling being done at the source. So every time you say new observable and it gives you an observer inside of there that you're going to next into, that observer that it's giving you, if you're just a, a root level uh, observable user, has to be an observer that when you next something into it, schedules that thing to go down the, the chain. Um, and then that also means that we have to refactor all of the operators to ensure that they're updating this thread local variable for uh, what the current observer is and that sort of thing. So it's a lot of work because there's a lot of operators. Um, yeah? Can, can we just put that in the, the base uh, subscriber? When you, when you next to it, it updates the, the variable? We, we can. The problem is there's, there's a lot of different types of behaviors that you end up having to model with different types of subscribers and observer, uh, observers. I think you and I talked about this. We, had, uh, we realized there were some weird edge cases around take, for example. Um, so it, it actually, in the prototype I built, it was nice because I was able to identify like, here's a class that is a source observer. So this is what is doing scheduling. Here's uh, operator observers. These are just pass-throughs where you don't have to have any safety checks or anything. It, these are you know, ones that we're building into the library. And then here's the, the, subscribe or the subscription observer that is the one that's wrapping whatever um, handlers or something that someone's given us and, and providing some guarantees at that level. So uh, it made it a little bit nicer, but then there was other uh, weird edge cases like uh, uh, operators that terminated like take and take until and those sorts of things I, I think that were hit. So I tried going through and just, just, well, how can I minimally implement this with what currently exists? And it was a nightmare, but it might have just been that I needed coffee at the time. I have no idea. So that's, that's the, there's lots and lots of work around that. The other, there's risks around this too, because we don't know all the cases. There aren't, any, there aren't any versions of Rx that I know of that are like this. Most is like this, uh, but most has a very minimal set of operators where we've got a lot of different operators. Um, you know, catch just being one minor example of something that's a little, that's quite different. Uh, so I don't really know, you know, what's gonna like, what sort of roadblocks we're gonna hit in some, like restructuring some of these operators to support this. And the other thing is it could be a breaking change for users uh, who are creating their own operators. Uh, definitely would be a breaking change for Paul Taylor, because uh, I'm sure that you're implementing operators with uh, you know, Lyft and that sort of thing where you don't have to do that with Rx even now. Um, so people that aren't doing that probably won't be affected, but uh, they won't get some of the performance benefits of this. Uh, but uh, the people that are implementing it with Lyft and Operator and, and that sort of thing are, are going to be affected. Um, and I already touched on this. Naively created operators won't benefit from this much. So, so people who create an operator by just inside returning new observable, that inside of there, that new observable, there's going to be scheduling at that point. So there'll be a try catch at that point as well. So they won't, they won't really see as much benefit. It'll be more if they're using the, the, the paved road of all of the operators that exist in RxJS 5, they'll see some uh, pretty solid performance benefits. So the benefits again are improved performance. It actually does reduce the size of the library. If we remove all of the fancy stuff we're doing to try to optimize try catching through all of our operators, it's a pretty reasonable uh, chunk of code. There's also some code that gets removed by virtue of the fact that we were, um, we have some conditionals around, oh, you didn't give us a scheduler, we'll run this immediately. Uh, in this world, everything would have to go through a scheduler, even things that you were just synchronously, recursively calling. Um, so there, that it eliminates that conditional there. So it does reduce the size of the code uh, uh, quite a bit uh, for some operators. And there's also some benefits for the, the Node.js power users that care about that, that core dump uh, um, visibility. So here's another thing that's asked of us a lot is roll-up handling. Um, it's really, really commonly asked question. We stopped exporting our, our ES 2015 builds. Um, there used to be a, a package. We need to deprecate this. This is one of the talking points. But uh, we, we stopped publishing that because we weren't sure we were doing it the right way. Uh, we're, I'm really heavily looking to the people that are in this room uh, for what they're going to do as far as 
supporting ES2015 and Rolt because it's one of those things where it doesn't affect a whole lot of ArcGIS users, but people do care about it. We get asked about it all the time, and I just want to make sure that if we're going to be like, here's the way that we do deal with ES2015 modules in Rollup, that we're doing that in such a way that it's it's kind of what the industry has kind of landed on. And, and when we last visited this, nobody was decided on anything. There was camps and banners and stuff. So that's, that's the, and the, the side note to this is right now, most of the code uh, that exists in RxJS is, is, are these operators. And the operators, when you use any of the, the patch uh, modules, are put on the prototype, which basically means that tree shaking isn't going to help you that much anyways, because they're, you brought it in, whether you use it or not, it's, it's been added to the prototype. So as far as Rollup knows, you're using it. So Rollup's really only going to tree shake like 2% or 1% of, of RxJS or something. So uh, definitely looking for solutions around that. Uh, the ideal thing would be if we could get function bind into the language, and then you wouldn't have to, you wouldn't have to uh, use prototype. I see Igor shaking his head. Maybe we can do that this afternoon. Just yeah, this afternoon. afternoon. <laughs> I don't know, let's push that in. <laughs> if anybody has some, some stockings we can pull over our face and some weapons, we can, go, we can go kidnap some TC39 people and put them up to it. So yeah. We have no clue. We're looking to you. That's the. This is. That's our current solution. So, you guys are it. Um, documentation woes. Docs are still sorely lacking. We've had a lot of really great contributions around this recently, but it, they're they're still kind of lacking. The new docs, I think, while prettier, a lot of people are having a hard time finding what they need in the new documentation. They don't support versioning. So as our versions change and features change, like how do people go back and get documentation for the version they're using? Uh, that sucks for people to get stuck in a large code base that you know maybe they're using, you know, 502, and and we've had a few small breaking changes. So we're at we're at Arc 7 now, VSMver. Like, how do they know that you know, that that the that the library they're using uh, has the features that are listed in the docs? We we don't have any versioning. Currently, we're using ES Doc because it was the best we could find when we started doing this. Uh, but we're not benefiting from TypeScript that much. Uh, it would be great if whatever documentation we were generating actually could glean information from TypeScript and give us uh, better stuff, but it doesn't. Um, and that is my final point, is documentation tooling that exists out there that we have available to use this isn't that great. Um, so at least in my opinion, uh, if, if people know of better things, then wonderful. I am very excited to try to start using those things if it solves some of our needs. Uh, but so we're looking for proposals and solutions around that. Need your help. Then the other thing related to documentation is tutorials. So anybody that's out there watching this or anybody in this room that really likes to bl write blog articles and tutorials, like this is the Google Trends graph for p like interest in ArcGIS. And, and actually, ArcGIS has been around much longer than this graph is actually graphing. I think in a large part, thanks to the popularity of Angu Angular 2 and Angular 2 using um, ArcGIS, like the searches for ArcGIS on Google have gone up uh, in kind of a hockey stick fashion. Um, so if, if you are interested in getting traffic on something where there's not a lot of content, uh, you know, you, you want to write a blog art article or tutorial on something where uh, you would be one of the only people writing about this, but there's a lot of interest, this is, RxJS is a great topic. So this is just me pleading to folks to, to do more of this. Again, uh, we, would, we would love your help with, with more blog post, posts and tutorials that people can reference. Uh, and and if, it's, if it's good enough, I'd be happy to, to try to push it into the readme somewhere so people see it right in our documentation. So and the final thing, uh, this, is, this is something we need, I think we need to look at um, this year is balancing performance. So RxJS 5 had goals around performance in terms of operations per second. So that meant doing a lot of the things that, that Mr. Paul Taylor was showing you earlier where we were optimizing around closures. We'd eliminate closures by introducing classes. But, and when you do that, I mean, it, it really does drastically speed up the, the number of operations, operations per second. And people who are running a lot of Rx in Node, uh, for example, uh, Netflix and Falcor, um, or people that are running really high performance apps in a browser, uh, really, really care about those ops per second. But then you have another group of people that they really care about the time to first interactive. Right, so they 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 want a library that's going to you know come down off of the 3G uh, crummy network connection very quickly and have just what they need and nothing more. And uh, in those people's cases, they might not care as much about those those closure optimizations. Right, so uh, you know 
kind of looking at like what what can we do to get the best balance of this for, for people? Um, is it getting performance gains out of the scheduler refactor and then you know maybe reintroducing some closures to, to try to reduce the size of the, the download size of the library or is it something else? There's been some interesting ideas around uh, Babel transformations that would identify closures and build out those classes for you so there would be like two versions of the library, like a light version that had the closures and then a version for people that really cared about the ops per second that, that had all the optimizations in there. Uh, that was an idea that came from Jaffer Hussein. So I think that's something that's worth investigating this year. And that's it, that's what I've got for, for slides. Hey there, are you into reactive programming using JavaScript? Do you have to deal with asynchrony in your web app? And join this dot instructor Ben Lesh to learn all of the ins and outs of RxJS in his hands-on workshop. Available online and in person, go to rxworkshop.com for more details and to book your spot today.